Hello and welcome to WeatherSnap. I'm Doug McNeil. In this episode, we're talking about methane. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that's about 80 times more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. My guest today is Dr. Fiona O'Connor. Fiona is a research fellow here at the Met Office Hadley Center, senior lecturer at the University of Exeter, and she's a leading expert on methane and its role in climate change. First, I'd like to understand what is methane, where does it come from, and why is it important for climate? So when we hear about climate change, we hear a lot about carbon dioxide. And of course, carbon dioxide is important. It's the largest contributor to climate change. But actually, carbon dioxide is only one of a basket of greenhouse gases causing our climate to change. And methane is the second most important of the greenhouse gases after carbon dioxide and has contributed about 0.5 degrees of the historical warming that we've observed to date. So from a climate perspective, it's really quite important. And just to put it into context, so the warming that we've observed to date since the pre-industrial period is about 1 to 1.2 degrees C. So you're talking quite a large proportion of that. That's right. Not only is it important in the context of climate, but also when methane is released into the atmosphere, it's chemically removed and converted to carbon dioxide and water. But a byproduct of that chemistry is the production of ozone, which, if it occurs close to the surface, is an air pollutant. Uh, it's damaging to human health. It can have negative impacts on crop yields and crop productivity. And so there's also an air quality aspect to methane, which isn't the case with carbon dioxide. What are the major producers of methane? Uh, and uh, when methane is released to the atmosphere, what kind of impact does that have over what kind of time scale? Methane has both emission sources from natural activities, but also there are human sources as well. So if we think of the pre-industrial period before the Industrial Revolution, the bulk of emissions of methane to the atmosphere would have been from natural sources. So when I refer to natural sources, I'm thinking about uh, wetlands, uh, I'm thinking about freshwater lakes, oceans and termites. And of course, emissions from human activity at that time would have been uh, very small. And so those natural sources effectively would have dominated the net flux of methane into the atmosphere. You said net flux there, Fiona. I'm trying to get an idea of the cycle that methane would go under. So it's being released from the wetlands and I think you said by termites there. Overall, in the industrial period, I'm assuming that the concentration of methane in the atmosphere was pretty stable. So if we look at the pre-industrial period, we would have had emissions into the atmosphere. Methane is chemically reactive in the atmosphere. So that chemistry would occur on a time scale of about 10 years or so. But also there would be some take up of methane by the biosphere and in particular by bacteria in the soil will consume methane. But it's the chemistry in the atmosphere that is by far the dominant removal process of methane from the atmosphere. And that chemistry leads us to what we might refer to as a, a lifetime or a residence time in the atmosphere, which is roughly about 10 years. So that residence time in the atmosphere of 10 years is obviously a lot shorter than carbon dioxide, but I understand that methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas. In terms of the impact on climate, it doesn't matter so much what methane we've emitted, say, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, because that methane has since been removed from the atmosphere. It's current emissions that determine the amount of methane in the atmosphere. By contrast with carbon dioxide, it's actually the cumulative emissions from the past that matter in terms of carbon dioxide. So what are the human emissions? What are the proportions of those? And how might we start to reduce those uh, sources of methane emissions? Yeah, so there are three main sectors that contribute to uh, human-caused emissions or, or anthropogenic emissions. So they include fossil fuels, both on the production and the use side. Agriculture is also a significant sector, and that contributes about 40% to human-caused emissions. And the third sector then is waste. Uh, that contributes about 20%, with the fossil fuels about 35%. I guess we'll take fossil fuels first. So my understanding is that some of this methane production is a sort of breakdown from burning of other things. Is that right? And venting, it's part of the production of oil or gas and leakage. What are the main places that this methane is coming from and how might they be reduced? 
with things like coal mines, there can be intentional venting of methane gas into the atmosphere. In the case of production of natural gases, there can be uh, leakage both at the production end, but also through the gas network that's used to supply methane gas or or natural gas, as we might refer to it, to our, our gas boilers that lots of us might use currently to either heat hot water or to heat our homes. Uh, So some of it is what we refer to as fugitive emissions, um, where there's leakage or or unintentional release into the atmosphere. But some of it is intentional through venting of coal mines, for example. That's really interesting. So it sounds like that problem of methane escaping into the atmosphere will naturally reduce as our reliance on fossil fuels diminishes, not on its own, but through policy over the next few years, that might really take a good chunk off of that emission. That's right. But I think also that the fossil fuel industry, even with current use of methane gas, could reduce its emissions. So, for example, with high resolution satellite observations, we can now detect areas of high leakage. So you know, we can prevent some of that leakage occurring at source as well, even with current fossil fuel use. You mentioned satellite detection there. So does that mean that the measurement of methane has changed over the last few decades? Um, You know, what is the latest technology and what were we using before to detect methane? There is a ground-based network of observation sites that's run by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, NOAA. And that network has been operating, I think, since about the mid 60s. Uh, And those sites are located or distributed through the globe so that you get a a reasonable global picture of what methane concentrations are doing in the atmosphere. More recently, that surface network then has been supplemented with satellite observations where, of course, we can use spectroscopic characteristics of methane. The strength of those instruments is that they can give us better global coverage, um, but also the, the footprint of those observations is also getting increasingly small, such that we can, at high resolution, detect leakage now. And, of course, that's a really strong way of then reducing those emissions from source. Yeah, I guess you can really target the largest emitters or you can find where those emissions are coming from even better and put in policies in place to to really target reductions in methane. Yeah, so those observations will often be used in combination with a model to back out the emissions that are consistent with those observations. Um, So it's a method called inverse modelling. Two other things that you mentioned that were the largest sources of methane to the atmosphere. You mentioned food. And you mentioned waste, which I assume are sort of related things in terms. I know that food waste uh, is is a big problem here in the UK. Um, and you know, in terms of agriculture, it's not like we're going to go and not feed everybody, right? The, the idea is that we're not going to get rid of agriculture if we want to reduce our methane emissions. It's really important to feed people, and it sounds like quite a big chunk of of methane emissions coming from agriculture as well. One of the largest contributors there is livestock and in particular ruminants. So cattle, for example, have multiple stomachs in which they're chewing, very fibrous grass and so on. And essentially within their stomachs is a process called enteric fermentation. And I I don't know the details of it, Doug, uh, but essentially that process produces methane, which they then literally burp out their mouths uh, (laughs) and into the atmosphere. A more minor uh, contribution to methane in the agricultural sector is also rice paddies. Of course, in some ways, they're very similar to wetlands. But in the case of rice paddies, we're intentionally flooding the land in, in order to produce rice. And then there's decomposition of organic matter taking place under the water where there's a lack of oxygen. And so that decomposition results in the formation of methane that then bubbles to the surface. Um, But it's largely the cattle that are the largest contributor there. And so there are some potential actions that can be taken. So some of it may be related to changing feed, for example, or, or supplements, or indeed things like selective breeding, such that we improve productivity and and animal health more generally. Um, But there's also work that can be done in terms of manure management as well, Um, things like biogas digesters and so on. So there's huge potential within that sector, as indeed in the fossil fuel sector, to, to reduce emissions.
Okay, and how about uh, food waste? What are the things that we can do to reduce uh, the amount of uh, methane coming from food waste or other waste? Waste, again, is, is an important uh, contributor to human emissions. So, for example, if organic waste is placed within landfill, and as you say, food waste is a significant problem in the UK, if that food waste ends up in landfill, again, it decomposes in the landfill, again, in the absence of oxygen and, and can produce methane, which is then released. One clear way is, is first of all, to reduce food waste. Um, the second way would be actually to, to separate food waste from other waste uh, such that it isn't going into landfill. And indeed, there are some local authorities that are taking that food waste and putting it into biodigesters and so on. Going back to global again, Fiona, I've got a couple of things I'd really like to get a hold of. And I guess the first one is the Global Methane Pledge. Could you explain just briefly what the Global Methane Pledge is? The Methane Pledge was announced at the Conference of the Parties in Glasgow in 2021. What the Global Pledge is trying to achieve is a reduction in anthropogenic methane emissions from 2020 levels by 30% by 2030. If that pledge is successful, there will be a benefit in terms of mitigating climate. But as we mentioned already, there will also be an additional benefit through improving air quality by reducing surface ozone concentrations. And that will have implications for both human health and for crop yields as well. Could you explain how ozone affects crops and how it affects human health? Ozone can cause people who have, for example, asthma or COPD. Their symptoms can be exacerbated in episodes of high pollution or poor air quality. It's also been implicated in birth defects and premature mortality as well. Um, in terms of crop yields, Leaves, for example, have what are called stomata or openings um, that are used for the exchange of gases, um, both oxygen and, and carbon dioxide. Ozone can also enter the leaf through the stomata as well, and that can be damaging to the leaf, which ultimately, in some cases, the leaf would represent the crop. Um, for example, if you think of leafy vegetables. And so there are studies looking at how ozone pollution in particular can impact on crop yields. This is a slightly controversial subject and the science may well not be there. But you mentioned earlier that the residence time uh, of methane in the atmosphere is around 10 years. And I wondered if there's anything like basically geoengineering, which could reduce the residence time in the atmosphere of methane and therefore remove some of that warming potential that it has. Are, are people looking at the science of, of speeding up the methane cycle in the atmosphere. Is that even possible? So there are a number of potential technologies that can be used uh, specifically uh, to look at methane removal from the atmosphere. Uh, there's one proposal, for example, using various uh, catalysts that might oxidise methane. There is a proposal about using iron salt aerosol, which might enhance what is currently a, a fairly weak sink that occurs over the ocean, um, but that iron salt aerosol may enhance that. We've done some idealised experiments within our Earth system model looking at the impact of methane removal. But we've done it in such an idealised way that it hasn't been, we haven't been able to look at any potential negative impacts on such technologies. So, for example, with the iron salt aerosol, there is potential for that aerosol to affect cloud. And of course, that could have consequences for, for rainfall patterns and so on. But equally, that mechanism is also enhancing a sink over the ocean through releasing chlorine. And of course, we know that chlorine has been responsible for ozone depletion. And so there are question marks over what is the fate of that chlorine? Would it be sufficiently long lived in the atmosphere to, you know, to, to go up in, the, in, in altitude to the stratosphere? So there's a whole range of questions to be answered there about uh, the technologies themselves. I know some people can be worried about the prospect of tipping points in the Earth system. And one of those might be the thawing of permafrost at high latitudes uh, in the Arctic, for example, uh, releasing a, a large amount of methane and really causing an ongoing climate warming. Can you 
describe what you think about the prospect or the risk of tipping points due to methane? I think there is a risk of a tipping point. So we, we know from observations already that uh, permafrost has degraded. And when the organic rich soils that's currently frozen in, in permafrost thaws, that carbon that is currently stored and frozen may be released to the atmosphere in the form of methane or carbon dioxide or both. And so there is a risk. How quickly that might happen, I don't know, but we are working on developing permafrost processes such that we can implement them within our Earth system model so that we can quantify the timescale uh, of those changes, but equally also model the, the release of the carbon to the atmosphere. So it sounds like as you're better understanding the natural and human processes which generate and remove methane from the atmosphere and from the land surface and from the oceans, you're better able to inform policymakers in order to reduce warming and other effects of methane. Fiona, thanks for joining us on Mostly Climate today. My thanks to Dr. Fiona O'Connor. My name is Dr. Doug McNeil. Our editor today was Adrian Holloway. The show was produced by Claire Nazir. Another great weather snap, Claire. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Then you catch all of our daily weathers on YouTube as well. And if podcasts are your thing, check out our Met Office podcast channel. Lots of information, lots of stories there. And we'll see you again next week.